Welcome friends to CNS series of interviews from the third Asia Pacific Feminist Forum or APFF 2017 being held in Chiang Mai, Thailand. APFF 2017 is organized by the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development or APWLD as it is more commonly known as. In this episode, we are in conversation with Judy Tagavalo, former Minister of Social Welfare and Development, Philippines. This department is the social welfare agency of the President of Philippines. She has been with APWLD since 1997 and is one of its oldest members. Judy has been an activist since her student days in women's rights in the context of societal changes. She has also been professor of women's studies for 20 long years and was imprisoned during the Marcos regime for her activist activities. Judy, as we all know, shrinking civic space is a reality in our nations, the Asia Pacific. Please share why human rights defenders like you are being targeted by the state when the state is supposed to be actually at the vanguard of human rights? Uh, well, I, I think the situation of the women or human rights defenders cannot be separated from the situation of the people in our societies, especially the, the poor. When we talk about human rights, we're not only talking of political rights or the right to organize, the right to assemble, the right to criticize, but we're also talking about basic rights to live, the right to food, the right to health, the right to land, the right to job security. So I think if I, uh, women human rights defenders are being pursued by the state, it will be in relation to our advocacy for the basic rights of our people. And these rights are not just political rights, but in the Philippines, for example, these are economic rights, the right to live, the right to have a job, the right to social services. So the connection is there. Uh, if the state is unable to provide these rights, then there will be uh, uh, dissent, and then there will be need to assert that uh, the people have rights to ensure their survival. What more needs to be done to protect human rights defenders, especially women? And why is this critical to achieve development justice? Historically, uh, human rights defenders have been at risk from different uh, forces. Uh, this was true during the, the time of the Marcos dictatorship where many human rights defenders, including women, have been killed. This is still true in many parts of the world now, including the Philippines. So the risk is there and it is necessary that uh, women uh, our women uh, rights are considered as human rights and women who fight for these rights should be protected, should be assisted, and should have the capacity to carry on with their work of helping people uh, achieve the basic rights uh, necessary for us to survive. You spoke with CNS earlier on how fundamentalism curtails women's already limited exercise of human rights and exacerbates violence against women. Would you please elaborate on this link between fundamentalism and women's human rights and violence against women? When we talk of fundamentalism, uh, it will range from what people know most, uh, religious fundamentalism, uh, which uh, believe that women are inferior to men, that women's place is in the home, that women should not be seen in public, or if they do, they should be silent and covered up. That's one form of fundamentalism, which actually 
definitely curtail women's rights to be human. And there is the other form of fundamentalism, what we call the economic fundamentalism. The belief that only a market economy, uh, a belief that profit is the motivator of well-being, that actually uh, has a very negative impact on women's lives because this has brought about privatization of health services, uh, uh, displacement of uh, fisher folks and farmers and their families from their land to give way to corporations. Uh, this has meant also the inability of the poor to have access to adequate health services because uh, it has become privatized. So economic fundamentalism and religious fundamentalism are both inimical to uh, women and their families and their right to live uh, humane as well as uh, a life that will enable them to fulfill their fullest potential. And how does militarization add to all this? Well, means? militarization means that uh, the military reigns supreme over the civilian authority. And we have seen in many cases in Asia as well as in the other parts of the country in Africa and Latin America that militarization has meant a propagation of an equal uh, economic relations where the land continues to be owned by landlords in spite of the fact that they don't work on the land or in spite of the fact that the farmers are supposed to have them. Or we have seen militarization in areas of uh, indigenous peoples which have been transformed into mines, you know, and they need military protection because the indigenous peoples are displaced and are therefore fighting back. So militarization or the rule of the military cannot be separated from economic policies and programs that are inimical to the poor but actually perpetuate huge economic inequalities in our countries. Uh, what about Philippines? What is, what is the situation in Philippines like? So the situation in the Philippines is not much different from other countries. Uh, uh, I think the one thing about the Philippines is that we are a rich country. Our natural resources are abundant. We have uh, seas and oceans and rivers still uh, abundant of, of natural resources. We have fertile land. Uh, we have mineral deposits. So in terms of natural resources, we're rich, but the people are poor. And this situation has had historical and structural roots. And it continues to be so, because even if you change, even if you change the man in the presidential palace, the person, the presidential, even if you have had women there, you know, the basic structural inequalities, the system that perpetuates the power of the elite, of the oligarchy of the few remains in place. You just change the person occupying the highest position, but the system is in place. So what is the way forward? Because I was going, my next question was about the, would bringing in more women in the parliament help the situation? Well, uh, parliament in the Philippines is definitely an arena dominated by the elite and the oligarchy. Many of them men, but also women, you know. In the Philippines, there are provisions prohibiting someone from holding office for three consecutive years. So, three, 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 nine years. So, what happened? So, if the parliamentarian, the MP term ends, then it's the wife who takes over. So, you have a situation where parliament, even if there are women in it, is still essentially an arena of the rich. So it can be an arena, but only very few uh, poor or truly representatives of the people can, can be there. What is important, I think, the experience of the Philippines and in many countries uh, who are part of APWLD would be movement building, developing the power, the voice, the knowledge 
and the solidarity uh, among women and among women and other sectors who want change. I think that's the most important thing. Not parliament per se, but parliament, yes, one arena. But definitely not the real arena for the poor. It will be in the villages, in the schools, in the streets, in the hospitals, in the forest, you know, that the people's power can be built through organization and through collective actions. I think we need more people like you there. You were called the People's Social Welfare Secretary. Mm. Why? <laughs> I think I tried very hard to make sure that the department, which is social welfare, and its resources are brought to the people, are for the people rather than uh, being used by politicians, by the elite, to perpetuate their own interests. And it has been a very difficult uh, journey because uh, the vested interests are very much entrenched. But I have done my best. Uh, I discovered that government has money, has resources. So the important thing is to bring this to the people who are in need of it without going through you know, the intermediaries who want to use this for their own political ends. So that's why I think I'm called the People's Social Welfare Secretary because uh, the Congress Parliament rejected me, you know, did not confirm me. So I ha I've been appointed by the President, but it has to be Parliament to confirm me. Con the par Parliament didn't confirm me, but did not give any reason publicly why they did not confirm me. So I I was sad because you know I would have wanted to serve the people more through through this agency but I said you know uh, the position in government is temporary but serving the people is forever. So uh, I think the people realized that in my short stay as minister for eight, 14 months, I did my best to serve them, to serve them with competence, with full honesty and with humility. And I think because of that, they were unhappy to see me go. So you are still the people's hero. Well, <laughs> that is right. important. Then, I, I think the important thing is whether you're in parliament, you're in the ministry, or you're in civil society, the important question is always for whom? Who will benefit from your activities? Who will benefit from your programs? Who will benefit from your services? My last question, Judy. What does this third APFF mean to you and to the people you work with? I think the Asia Pacific Feminist Forum is an innovative uh, forum to bring together diverse groups of women uh, wanting change uh, in various ways. So we have uh, women artists, we have women workers, we have women migrants, we have women with disabilities, we have young women, we have old women, uh, we have uh, movement women, we have uh, academician. I think that that is the difference is uh, it's that this diversity that allows us to celebrate uh, our solidarity but also to reiterate that we need to be together to bring about change and the message is change can be brought about only if we work together to bring about not just cultural changes but structural changes within our village, our country, in the Asia-Pacific region, and globally. That's the message of the APFF, working together for real change in the various arenas. Thank you, Judy. Friends, you were just now listening to Judy Taguvalo, former minister for the Department of Social Welfare and Development and a gender rights activist from Philippines with whom Citizen News Service was in conversation with at the 3rd Asia-Pacific Feminist Forum or APFF 2017, which is being held in Chiang Mai, Thailand. APFF 2017 is organized 
by the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development. For more details, be welcome to check out the APWLD's website www.apwld.org or visit CNS at www.citizen-news.org. Thanks for listening and stay tuned. Thank <laughs> you.